15th. That'll be a week away. We got the Christmas Eve service coming up, 7 p.m., and then Christmas Day that next morning, our normal time, 10 o'clock. And so looking forward to all that. But man, it just goes so quick. So it is upon us. But all for a good reason, a good cause. I was thinking about how that new baby Tyler's got. You know, a baby changes things, doesn't it? You all have been there, done that. A baby changes things. And yet, Christ, that baby, man, changed everything, right? Changed everything. Can't talk enough about Christ. Well, thinking about Christmas, this grandmother, she... You know how it is as you get a little older, your grandkids, man, you don't know what they want for Christmas, do you, right? So she's like, I'm not going to buy them anything this year. I'm just going to write out a check, send them a card, and, you know, they can do with it what they want, right? So she sat down at her little desk where she pays the monthly bills, wrote out a check to each one of them, made out a card, put the cards in the envelope, mailed them out, and heard nothing back all through Christmas. <laughs> She was a little surprised. She thought, you know, no thank you, no call, no card or self back, nothing, nothing. She's like, well, you know kids these days, right? So January came around. She sat back down that little desk to pay the monthly bills, and uh, she noticed she had one of those desk pad calendars, mm -hmm. and she noticed something sticking out, and she peeled that back, and there was one of the checks to one of the grandkids, and she got to look, and there was all the checks to all the grandkids. She forgot to put them in the car. So they got a card, and this is what they got. Um, this Christmas, buy your own present. Love, Grammy. <laughs> so there's a saying, you know, it's the thought that counts. Well, words matter too, don't they? <laughs> words matter too, and the thoughts behind those words. So anyway, don't let that be you, all right? Don't let that be you. Well... Listen to this statement. You're going to hear it today. You're going to hear it for probably a while. And I've probably even said it before. But Jesus did not only come to save you from something. Jesus came to save you for something. Hope you realize that. Not just from something, but for something. We know he saved us from our sins to all those that accept and believe. And we know that in that salvation, that redemption, that has saved us for a life everlasting. Right? So not just saved from something, but saved for something. And the Bible says that we can't even imagine or comprehend what God has prepared for those, right, that love him. So you don't even know all that God's prepared you for. But if there's something. <coughs> We're going to get into our series here. We've been talking about wise men, wise men say. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 through 8. We'll break it down a little bit. Some of this we covered last week, but we'll go through it again here. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. That's as far as we got last week. We'll get a little farther today. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Verse 5, In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, For this is what the prophet wrote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. In verse 8, then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. So the wise men, they traveled from very far away. We talked about it last week, uh, possibly coming from as far as uh, Iran, uh, Persia, um, led by this star. The star, interestingly, took them first to Jerusalem. We'll talk more about that in a second. But there's a lot of theories about this star. What was it? A comet, a supernova, a planet, uh, whatever. It's the old twinkle, twinkle little star. How I wonder what you are. You don't have to wonder. It's a star. All right? A supernatural thing, right, from a supernatural God 
placed supernaturally that led these wise men to where they were. God used that star and his word. We talked about some prophecy last week. He used the star and the prophecy to move the minds and hearts of the wise men. They followed it, understand it. Let me back up. They followed it with no misunderstanding about where it was going to lead them. Remember, they knew this is going to lead us to the newborn king of the Jews. Not just to a king, but the king of the Jews. They knew that before they even set out. Well, once they arrived in Jerusalem, they went to that Jerusalem was the capital. So the star had led them at least that far. And there in the capital, the wise men, they started asking, where's the king of the Jews? This newborn king of the Jews that's been born, where is he? Well, that information was news to Herod. He thought he was king. Usually everybody that came there wanted to see him. Wise men just went directions. How about that, right? Herod didn't know the wise men were coming. He had no idea about the star. He didn't know a king had been born. And Herod didn't know where Jesus was born. That verse 3, look back, Matthew 2, verse 3. We've read it, but look at it again. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. I can promise you when uh, Tyler's son was born this week, there was a lot of excitement, I'm sure. I'm sure Heather had a great day that day. Right? That's a good day. Christ is born and Jerusalem's in a turmoil. Why are they in such a turmoil? Because the king's in a turmoil. And why is the king in a turmoil? Because it's a threat to the throne. Right? It's a threat to the throne. He's worried. He's disturbed. We talked last week about worship, and we're going to talk more about it in this today. We go through some things here. We're going to see what real worship is, because the wise men came determined to worship him. And again, we're going to see certain aspects of that. But all of Jerusalem was stirred up because of this baby. <laughs> and not in a good way. They were worried. The people were worried because Herod was worried. And that all just trickles down, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> King gets mad. It's not going to be good for us. We're not much different, are we, right? Government's in an uproar. Well, that trickles down to us, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So we can relate. First thing here, real worship searches, seeks after the truth. Look at verse 4 through 6 again. Let me reread those. He, being Herod, he called a meeting of the leading priests, teachers of religious law, and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, For this is what the prophet wrote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling saints of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Now these verses pretty, these all these three verses right here are pretty interesting. Because Herod's going to get his own wise men together. Every ruler, government, they got their own yes men type people, don't they? Their own wise men, they call them. And uh, uh, he's like, hey, where is this newborn king of the Jews going to be born? Do you know anything about this? And they're just like, yeah, we know about it. He had to be thinking, you know, what do you mean you know about it? I mean, they, there's no hesitation here. They're like, yeah, the prophet Micah spoke about it. Now, they kind of paraphrase what was prophesied 700 years earlier from Micah. It's Micah 5.2. I don't know. I think we'll have the verse up here. But this is what Micah wrote. Um, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Well, you know, that didn't sit well with the king when he sit, they tell him the ruler of Israel, right? Um, it's those names. Bethlehem means bread, uh, house of bread. All right? These names are really interesting. All names in Scripture usually have some kind of significant meaning. Bethlehem, house of bread, and the Ephrathah, it's interesting. It means uh, fruitfulness. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about that is if you take... 
Christ and things that he said, he declared himself to be the bread of life, right? John 6, 22 says this, My Father gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So it's interesting, this house of bread, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem, right? It's, it's not a coincidence, the symbolism. And then this fruitfulness, we, we know Christ came to give us a full life, but there's even more because Christ is also known as what's called the first fruits, all right? Let me read you a verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. There is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. That's good news for you and I. <laughs> That's part of the, hey, he saved you for something, not just from something, right? Christ is, he's, he's not just bought our redemption, but he's also provided the way of everlasting life. And as the example, he resurrected first, first fruit, and then his fruit, you and I, we will resurrect as well. He's the example, right? Now, Bethlehem's about six miles from Jerusalem. And that verse, it talks about, though you are little, it was not very big. Right Here we are, Hemlock's not very big, is it, people? Our surrounding community's not very big. Merrill's smaller than Hemlock, right? And you can go to Brant and Marion Springs, and they're a whole lot smaller, too, right? Bethlehem's probably 300 people at this time. So it's tiny. It's small. Everybody in Bethlehem probably wanted to get out of Bethlehem, right? When they grew up. But Bethlehem, it's interesting, it was the home of David, King David. This is where Samuel <clears throat> went to David's family and anointed David king instead of Saul. We're going to get into, uh, David's fascinating, after we get through the first year, we're probably going to do a study on David, because there's just so many neat things there and application for us in David's life. But Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, the royal lineage of David. Born in Bethlehem, all to fulfill prophecy. And so it's interesting when Herod's own wise men wanted to know, or when Herod wanted to know from his wise men where they were, where Jesus was, what was happening, they went to the Bible for the truth. Isn't that interesting? What was written of old told them about what was happening in their presence. 700 years prior told them what was going on right now. That hasn't changed people. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think the Bible, that's just some old book. It's just old news, old story. It just doesn't, right? It's a piece of literature, whatever. This isn't old news. It's the good news, Amen. right? And listen, it's just as current today. It's just as current today. People that say, well, it's outdated, you don't know it. <laughs> it can't be outdated. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to hear what it has to say. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? You're outdated. Yeah. God's word reveals what's really going on, tells you what's to come. Timeless truth. Truth for our time. Truth for all time. And remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. So if you want answers, if you want the truth, go to God's Word. It's all there. Real worship seeks the truth. And then listen, real worship believes the truth, accepts the truth. Herod's so-called wise men, they got the head knowledge, right? They got the head knowledge. Oh yeah, we know about that. Michael wrote about it. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Remember, it's just six miles away from where they were. And these guys have to come from hundreds of miles away to tell them what's happening six miles from where they are. <laughs> Government's always been out of touch, people. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they knew it as fact, but not as life-changing truth. There's a reason why they're disturbed by the news, because they don't see it as the good news. And listen, that still happens today with your friends, your family, 
your neighbors, whoever it is, Jesus Christ, it's going to cause one of two reactions. It's either going to cause, I don't want to talk about that, or, hey, yeah, let me tell you about what he did for me, right? Mm -hmm. There's only two ways that story goes. Herod's wise men were aware, but Herod's wise men did not care. If they would have cared, they would have been watching for Jesus, but they weren't. Real wise men believed, and their faith, their belief, was expressed in their obedience, their following, that star. They'd been looking for the truth, searching for the truth, following the wisdom, right, from God's word prophecy and from above the star, real wisdom that only comes from God, and they believed it was from God. And think how far their faith, their belief took them. Right? Hundreds of miles, many months. It's believed maybe up to two years. We kind of get that from Scripture later on in, in a discussion with Herod. They started traveling when the star appeared. Right? They brought gifts convinced they would see the king. Hebrews 11.6, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? There's no pleasing God without faith. And when you believe, you have to believe that God rewards those that seek him. Huge difference between the wise men from afar and the wise men that were only six miles away. Right? Real wise men sought after the truth, believed the truth. That's what real worship is. And real worship is personal and life changing. Look at verse 7 and 8. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. He learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. So you've heard that saying, wise men still seek him. Well, Herod's anything but wise. He told the wise men, you find him. Then come tell me. Listen, no one can worship Jesus for you. <laughs> no one can find Jesus for you. No one can have Jesus for you. I, you know, I know we're... We kind of got a poor here, right? We got a lot of people out, travel, Christmas, sickness, and a lot of other things. But listen, you all know, and you have to cling to and understand that, listen, you can't rest on the tradition of your parents' faith. You can't rest on anything of anyone else. It must be your personal walk with the Lord, right? It's got to be that personal choice you make. John 6.45 says this, Jesus said, Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to Me. Everyone. It's an individual thing. Verse 47, I tell you the truth, He who believes has everlasting life. He who believes. Again, individual choice. You can't pick it for your child. <laughs> you can't pick it for your parents. You can't pick it for your friend. You can't pick it for your neighbor. You can't pick it or choose it for anyone. They have to come. Now, God can use you, right? Your testimony. God can use you to draw people to himself. He does that all the time. That's your testimony. But you cannot make that decision for anyone else. You can't save. You and I can't save anyone. <coughs> Christ does all the work. And it's a decision you have to personally make. Jeremiah 29, 13, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Listen, if you don't worship Jesus as king, it's because you don't, you choose not to worship him as king, right? Bottom line, we, we make a lot of things complicated. We make things complicated in church. We make things complicated in teaching. We make things complicated in the world. We make a lot of complicated excuses, and it just comes down, you either want Jesus or you don't. That's the bottom line. You don't need to make excuses for anyone. And I'm not saying that to, to not in love or harsh, but listen, if your friends, extended family, whoever, spouse, whatever, if they don't 
want Jesus, that's why. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you give up on them, you pray for them. You always pray for them as long, you've heard me say it, as long as they have breath, there's hope. But you don't have to make excuses for it. It is what it is. It will not be that someone kept him from you. It will not be for lack of opportunity. Look at this verse, Romans 1.20. It's a great verse. Many of you know it. It's a very powerful verse. It says, for ever since the world was created. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. People have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Just simply look, you can't walk out and see the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the lakes, the oceans, the great lakes. You can't. How can you go out and look at any of that and not think, oh my word, there must be a God. And that's what God's saying here. They're, they're without excuse. <laughs> what did Jesus say? Even the rocks would cry out <laughs> and worship me. And they are. <laughs> Listen, nature's not in a turmoil. It's only in a turmoil because of man's sin, right? <laughs> you have Jesus. If you want Jesus, you worship Jesus. If you want to worship Jesus, Matthew 2 8, we read it, but look at it again. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child. Notice it says child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Funny thing, Herod used the truth he was told to have the wise men find Jesus. Isn't that something? He used the truth to have somebody else find Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them. They can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. I just think it would have been, you know, to be that fly on the wall watching the wise men having this meeting with Herod and his wise men. And his wise men, Herod's, tell him exactly where Jesus is going to be born. It's only six miles from here. He had just as much opportunity to follow the wise men as they did, following the star. It's just six miles. What effort does King Herod have to go to, right? They'll pull the coach up. He's just got to sit and ride, right? And the wise, his wise men themselves, they know all this. But it hasn't gone from here to here. And they send the wise men on their way. Basically, they're saying, you go find him. We know what's going on with, with Herod. He wanted to have Jesus killed. He's not going to worship him. The wise men that have all the head, they're not going to worship him, his wise men. Herod wasn't interested in worship, worshiping. He wanted the information so he could kill Jesus. He wanted to remove the threat to the, the throne. Herod was just a messed up individual uh, this Herod, history tells us he drowned one of his own sons over a threat of <clears throat> his son taking the throne. That's kind of how monarchies work, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he just going to take him out. Took him out, one of his sons. If only Herod would have seen his own stubbornness and mortality <clears throat> as a threat. <clears throat> right? But Herod's not a lot different than you and I are and people are, right? When it all comes down to it, Herod didn't want to change. Herod didn't want to give anything up for Jesus. And Herod didn't want to worship Jesus as king. He was king. King of his life. King of his plans. <coughs> Herod would have never worshipped Jesus because Herod worshipped Herod. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, you and I know a lot of people that just worship themselves. And you and I, if we're not careful, can fall into that same thing, right? Yep. Herod chose not to believe, chose not to follow the wise men to Jesus, chose not to worship Jesus, and chose not to have Jesus change him. And listen, real worship of Jesus changes everything. Worshiping Jesus changes you. 
And if it doesn't change you, then you're not really worshiping Jesus. I was talking to Judy and Mary before, and we were talking about Rebecca's grandfather and just some different things. And I was talking about my family. Her family had a long line of pastors in their family. My family had a long line of <coughs> pastors in my family lineage. And I know my mother. I know my name. I told some of you before, but my name Clayton actually comes from an evangelist out of Ohio. His name was Larry Clayton. My mother named me, my father and mother named me after an evangelist. My mother was praying for me to be in the ministry before I was born. And I wanted nothing to do with it. I just wanted to make money. I had a whole set of Clayton plans. A whole bunch of them. Clayton was going to be in politics, people. I was going all the way to the top. I'm not kidding. That was the plan. I remember somebody specifically, I was in Idaho at a store set up for a Sam's Club I was in charge of, and somebody said something to me about, you know, you, you sound like you ought to be a pastor. I, we weren't even talking about something Christian. It was just something my voice. And I laughed and said, that'll never happen. <laughs> I remember that. And man, God then just rocked my world. Not in a good way. Well, a good way in his way. Right? That's how God works, right? That's how God works. We've got to get our attention. We get stubborn. Our own stubbornness, our own mortality doesn't threaten the throne we want to have. <laughs> we think we're going to live forever our way. God's trying to say, man, I want you to live forever my way. And my way is so much better than your way. So much better. You can't worship Jesus and not change. It's impossible. You can't go to God's word and not have God's word change you. It doesn't happen. 1 John 2, 15, 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, I can't fall in love with it, people. Why would we want to anyway? It's messed up. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Listen, real worship leads to true joy. If your hang-up to worshiping Jesus is that you don't want to give up control, then you don't understand what it fully means to worship Jesus. You don't really understand what Jesus does for you. He came to set you free. He came to give you life, not suffer loss. John 10.10 10 says, I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So Chris, come on up here. We're going to close here. But I was reading, it's been a while back, but there was an article or something I read about lifeguard and it was talking about, the lifeguard was telling about how um, he'd been trained to rescue someone. And it was pretty interesting because he was talking about the fact that one of the first things they teach a lifeguard when a victim is, is drowning is that what happens is, you know, it's the panic. They go into panic. They start flailing their arms, kicking their feet and everything else. And if the lifeguard rushes right in to try and rescue them, more than likely the victim will take them both down. And so they actually train the lifeguard that before they, they get in close proximity, they have to calm that person down. And the moment they calm them down, which is really the victim gives surrenders control, then they can go right in and rescue them easily. Mm -hmm. But it's the whole fight for the control. Mm -hmm. Listen, your desire for control is costing you joy. <laughs> Your desire for control, it's robbing you of it. Uh, Jesus said, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Not half full. Not just a little bit of joy. According to that verse, all the joy. I mean, full must mean all, right? And not my joy, his joy. And I got I to gotta think God's joy is a lot better than mine. My joy is not all that great all the time. 
My joy might not even look like joy at all. Just ask my own eyes. <laughs> Jesus Christ didn't just come to save you from something, to save you for something. Herod never accepted either of those truths. Herod heard the news about the newborn king, but was disturbed and troubled by it. He didn't want to lose the throne, didn't want to surrender control, didn't want to change, didn't want Jesus. And in the end, you know how it works. Herod's not still alive. Let's be honest. Herod's in hell right now. You think Herod would want to do things differently? He tried to keep control and hang on to everything, and in the end, he lost it all for forever. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 24, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads. Why don't you just, I'm going to rattle off some questions here. They're just kind of a rhetorical in the sense of you just think about them. You answer to God. Do you want to know the truth? Are you willing to search after it? Are you willing to accept and believe what the truth is? Are you willing to accept it and believe it even if it means you're going to have to change? Are you willing to give up that control? Listen, do you want joy? Full joy? His joy? Are you willing to worship Jesus? Are you really willing to worship Jesus? Fathers, we come before you. God, I pray. That, God, your word would just break through our thoughts, break through our stubbornness, break through, God, our desire to want to control everything. We don't even realize of the joy that we are robbing ourselves of because we simply can't turn everything over to you. God, I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd help us love you. I pray you'd help us truly worship you. I pray you'd help us search your truth, believe your truth, accept it, live in it, trust it. God, trust you. God, whatever it is you need to do in each and everyone's heart that's here, God, those maybe listening, watching online, Lord, God, I pray you'd speak to them. God, Herod never responded. His wise men never responded. They only had to go six miles. But they just couldn't do it because their heart wouldn't let them do it. God, I pray that wouldn't be us. Let our minds and our hearts and our actions, our faith, dear God, be all about worshiping. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. All right, everybody. Again, there's not a lot of announcements. It's pretty simple. Christmas Eve, 7 p.m. Christmas Day, 10 a.m. Be here. It's going to be...